Um, so this is me. Uh, project is called What If You Just Leave It? And the talk is Rewilding Unwrapped. I'll talk about more about what I mean by that in a minute. Um, the talk is in four sections. Uh, introduction, my journey, um, the outcomes, the things that I've produced as a result of the work, and the findings, the, the things I've learned um, along the way. And obviously I can't do everything I've learned along the way in a 45, 50 minute talk. So it'll just be a few selected things, but um, I hope they resonate with you and you enjoy them and are inspired by it. And there's lots of photos along the way. So I will whiz through quite a canter through some case studies. Um, to give you an idea. But whenever you see the, the eye of the white park, which is this photo here, um, then you know I'm going into a different section. Uh, so this is the first session introduction. And really, this is the photo that's not mine. It's the cover of the book Wilding that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But in terms of me, I did a PhD in biodiversity and tropical forests about, oh gosh, 25 years ago now. Um, I followed this with biodiversity research in South America. Um, and then I kind of ended up managing the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site, which is a geological site, but it's, it's old biodiversity, that's the way I, I looked at it. Um, and it gave me a lot of insight into protected area and uh, uh, management and nature conservation. And in 2019, I decided it was time to move on to get a little bit more back to my, my roots in, in nature and the biological sciences, um, and also try and follow a passion I've had all my life, which is in photography. So I took up a part-time master's in photography at the Arts University in Bournemouth. And I happened to be reading Wilding, and as you do, because it's, it's an amazing book. Um, and I thought, well, I've got to do a project for my master's and what better to do than, than rewilding? And I don't regret that for a second. It's been a fantastic journey. And so I, I really have Isabella Tree to, to blame for this. And I did tell her that when I interviewed her. Um, and I think she said a lot of people have said that. So what is rewilding? Well, the whole talk is, is to some extent about what is rewilding. And, and, I'll, and I'll really dwell on that at the end a bit. Um, but, you know, as this quote from Rewilding Britain says, we are in trouble. Nature is in trouble in this country, in Europe, in, in other places around the world. Um, in the UK, so many species are in decline, so many are threatened. Um, we really are struggling and we have been for so long. And rewilding is something that's, that's although it's been around since the 80s, um, it has more recently come to the fore in a way about allowing nature to take the lead in restoring ecosystems and helping them be more resilient. Um, rather than people thinking we know what we're talking about, it's about nature knowing what it's talking about and letting nature get on with it. But often, you know, we need to kickstart the process. We need to keep an eye on it. Um, I asked, so, so what I did is I, I went around the country, I talked to different people and different places and different projects. Um, I asked what is rewilding? I asked why is it important? And I asked why should we care? And if I asked 30 people the first question, I got 30 different answers. If I asked the second question, I got kind of more or less the same thing. Everyone understands why it's important um, in terms of the people doing it. And why should we care? Lots of different thoughts around that. And I did interviews, uh, which are recorded and some are now podcasts. I did still photography, digital and film. No film today, I'm afraid, no time for that. But also uh, I did drone stills and video and uh, I've got some drone stills to show you, but there's no video today either, again, time. But there's more of this on my website. And you know, sometimes it's quite hard to make an interesting photo out of a green field, which kind of is, is what a lot of places start as. Um, so I, I chose an approach to look at the people, because rewilding is led by people. The engineers, which in this case are the ecosystem engineers, are the animals, mainly the, the large herbivores, um, and the places that, that start and become, and the, the, the flower, the plants that are within those places and the landscapes. Um, that was my approach to the work, and it developed over time. And why, what if you just leave it? Well, what if you just leave it was a bit of a joke between my friend Nick uh, and me. Um, early on when we visited a, a farm and I kind of said well I, James why don't you just leave it and, and then it came from there and we stuck with it because actually it's quite a provocative thoughtful question um, you know because rewilding itself is, is perhaps sometimes a bit toxic for some people the word uh, um, the R word as some organizations call it um, and I'll come on to the end whether I think you can actually just leave it or not but it's about you know is this abandonment is it management what is it? It's a provoking question, which, which really gets people thinking. And rewilding unwrapped, why is that? Well, because people have heard of rewilding, you know, from the Archers or from Izzy Tree's book or from the, the papers these days or Jeremy Vine's show, good Lord. But um, 
a lot of people don't understand what it is. You know, Jeremy Vine talks about wolves. It's not all about wolves. It's not even at all about wolves, frankly. Um, so I thought I would try and unwrap and, and just explore the subject a bit more and, and through the work I've done, try and explain it rather than just tell people that this is what it is. Um, I'm not talking about the theory today. I'm not talking about shifting baseline syndromes, trophic levels, emergent properties, all of that stuff. I'm sure that that's happened before with Devon Marlachos talks, or I could come back and talk about that another time, but I'm not the expert there, although I'm, I'm certainly learning. Um, but I will mention the fact that this is all natural process led throughout. That is the principle behind it. And I'm trying to show rewilding through the photos to lay it bare, so to speak. Um, so uh, I'm going on to the journey. So I, I, I've interviewed a lot of people and photographed quite a lot of places. And I'm going to choose, I've chosen four case studies for this talk and also uh, a bit about the beavers as well. Um, but uh, any journey has to start somewhere. And this started with Tim. So Tim Smith, who set up the Eden Project, is a friend. And I used to work with him in context of the Jurassic Coast a little bit. And I called him up and said, can I come and interview you? Uh, because basically I didn't know where to start. And he knows people and, and Tim, he's a lovely guy and he's a great thinker. And I interviewed him and some of you may have heard the podcast uh, with that. And um, he, he was brilliant. He set me up with links with people. He gave me lots to think about and it really started. So I'm very grateful for Tim for that. He also gave me this amazing quote here, which I think will fire up some people from Wildlife Trust, the wildflower lovers out there. But he, his quote was about, you know, you can't just concentrate on wildflowers, which some people do. Um, because it's just scratching the surface, it's cosmetic. Uh, and that, that certainly provided some uh, interesting conversations with some people. Um, but where have I been then? So this is a map of the UK. It is mainly South England, to be fair. Um, although I am going to be visiting uh, Wild, uh, Wild Ennerdale uh, fairly soon, up in the Lake District. Um, and uh, I'm going to be going to another place in Scotland in May as well, to Allerdale there. Um, so I've got a big gap in Wales and, and other parts of the country, which I'm looking to start to include over the course of this year. Ken Hill was a fantastic place. I'm not doing the case study there today, but uh, you've probably seen that on Spring Watch or the Autumn Watch. I can't remember which, um, but they are, are really striving ahead with this. Um, and obviously in the southwest, um, because it's close to home for me, home is, is Dorset, Bridport. Um, there are there are more sites there are places of real interest whether they're where I met people to talk about projects or whether there's specific projects or related projects going on I even interviewed the great Harry Barton um, and I shall be doing the podcast of Harry uh, relatively soon just need to get around to it so the first of my case studies uh, is Trello Warren in Cornwall now Trello Warren is on the um, it's down here, it's on the lizard. And this photo here is of Erica Bagans, which is a rare uh, heath plant, which is a, it's a heather type plant, which is only really found in the UK in Cornwall um, and is very much under threat. Um, and I'm showing that because purely by chance or by nature did when, when Ferris Vivian, who I'll show you in a second, started to do the rewilding project, did this start to come back? And that was a real mark of success of the project, even though there was no intention for that to be done in the first place. So um, this is this is what I'm, a lot of what I found is this whole issue of, of rewilding as a way of, of bringing on natural processes and then seeing what happens. And just some of the most amazing things have happened without any expectations, without any planning. Um, but just allowing nature to take to, to, to take the lead. So this is Ferris, the man who most looks like his dog of anybody I've ever met, who's a, a fabulous guy and lives in this uh, awesome house. I think it needs quite a lot of work. Um, and they, the, the family have been there for 700 years. They've got um, street names and pubs named after them in Camborne. Uh, and it, and it's, it's, it's a classic um, example of a, of a landed estate in England. Um, but he wants to move away from the intensive agriculture. Uh, he wants to rewild. He wants to use that for obviously for, for tourism purposes, to find replacement incomes for a, a, a difficult agricultural situation. But he is an agronomist and he's absolutely passionate about this. Um, you know, he's, the, the land that he has um, that he started with is is this kind of terrain intensive. Uh, this is uh, rye grass, which is used for silage, and then there's there's been commercial forestry on the land as well. And he's now taking that uh, aspect of that and, and putting it, um, allowing it to rewild. Um, his engineers, his, his 
engineers of choice for doing this are ponies and they are not Exmoor, they're not Dartmoors, but they're some kind of a Bodmin, Dartmoor, Exmoor cross mix, which uh, they're beautiful animals. And just by having the four ponies uh, uh, browsing and grazing on this area of land, which is not huge, but it, it's an interesting, a useful size area, and you can he start to see changes in five years. Um, and you know they, they the ponies are very hardy. They're out a year. They're not something to be fed. They just do their thing, and they really start to to keep um, the, the ecosystem working. And one thing Izzy Tree told me was that that um, pony saliva is actually really good for new growth on trees. So when they when they um, eat the, the the different um, they eat the leaves off the trees. Uh, then the, the saliva is actually helps promote regrowth, which is something I didn't know about before. And it's, it's fantastic. So it shows you the um, these interactions with nature that we start to see through this kind of process. Um, what's happening is, is if you look to the to the right, this is the commercial forestry that was there and is still is still there. He hasn't taken it all down. And this is the scrubland that's developing here. And he's had some biodiversity work done, some surveys done with Exeter University. And they're showing an increasing number of species every year. So it's becoming a real success story there. And, you know, there's little bits of wetland which are, um, are cropping up here and there. And then within that, there's little bits of peat generation as well. Um, and the Erica Vagans, which I showed you at the start, it's just came out of nowhere. It's the sort of thing that Natural England would be, would be crying out to do a project which can uh, uh, create a system which is dedicated to restoring Erica Vagans. And he, this happened purely by the process of, of, um, of rewilding um, and allowing nature to take its course, allowing the, um, the ponies to, to play their role in stopping it returning to, to forestry again. And, and it's superb the way this is happening. So that's Trello Warren. Um, it was a great start for me. It was a real learning curve and it helped me get on the way and helped me. So when I got to NEP, I actually had a start to have a slight clue of what I was talking about. But, um, so I did manage to get a, a, an invite to NEP, again, thanks to Tim. And NEP has been, I've now had four visits there, and it has been the source of probably the majority of the images I've used for different parts of this course. But it, it was quite amazing to go there and spend time there and get to know the team, um, because it's a very special place uh, over here in just north of Brighton in West Sussex. Um, and as you can see, there's a, a fairly young male fallow deer just peeking out there from behind the bushes, which is just you know vaguely Serengeti like although I haven't been to Serengeti but it, it does make you feel as though you're in a wild space so if I go forward this as I said people are crucial to this as I've showed Ferrer's it was his choice to rewild at Trello Warren obviously Izzy Tree and Charlie Burrell they made the decision in, in 2000 to to pack up the farming business so to speak to um, to make the change they, they the land was marginal they they were struggling to make any money some years they didn't some years they did it was problematic um and they said let's just let this go let's work it out as we go along and you know they really did work it out they used the Franz Vera model they brought in herbivores they actually put a fence around for deer um, and they gradually changed they gradually got some some funding for this and you know you've read the book it, the success story is amazing that, that what's happened there but that that all took guts um, from Izzy and Charlie to do this in the first place um, and two quotes from them which from, from my interviews which I, I really like is that Izzy is saying you just got to go and do it you just got to get on with it and do it um, and Charlie's was that that you know should I asked him should rewilding be restricted to marginal land he said no everybody should be able to walk out of the door into wildlife and that's about working with intensive farmland in terms of the margins in terms of the, the river systems and the wetlands and so on. So that yes, farming is still going on and more intensive production is going on, but there are wilder areas around that. And, and I very much welcome that comment. But it's not just the owners who are important, it's the people who do the work on the day-to-day -day in the field. At NEP, you have Pat Toe, the, um, the stockman, who's a, who's a legend. You have Penny Green, the senior ecologist, and Ivan, uh, de Clay, who kind of does everything else, which is what Ivan says. But again, my latest podcast is an interview with Penny and Ivan, and you can find out more about what he does there. And they're they're a fantastic team. There, you know, the, and then we go on to the um, the engineers there. They have the the English Longhorns, which uh, is the first time I'd really come across and spent time with with you know stock that had had horns. 
um, and were not afraid to waggle them if they if you got too close. They were not afraid to use them to to, to tear through a hedge. Um, and this is how animals used to be. In the world. This is how herbivores used to be in, in the wild. Um, and it's great to see because it is it is a more natural way of managing stock. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time there. This was particular. July morning when it was misty and, and I, I spent time just being near the, the, the cattle until they were kind of used to me, um, which meant I was able to take photos like this, which I absolutely love. Um, and it's quite, quite intimate. It's almost like I'm intruding onto their, uh, their terrain. Um, but th this was just the, the, the cow pushing through the hedge to try and find a tasty morsel. And it doesn't matter what happens to the hedge. That's just part of of what they do and how they operate in a more wild environment. And, and it was fascinating because um, this, as you can see from this photo, they are, they're very close, they are, they are saying hello. And I found that with watching the, the, the wilder free roaming cattle, they, they inter the social interaction they did, the, the grooming they did, mutual grooming and, and self-grooming, it, it just seemed most, farmers and they tell me otherwise but but i've not seen that and it's really beautiful to see um of course there's the the red deer that they have there the kings of the mountains as they are in scotland but they are a really um fantastic beasts and their ability to browse different species that that the ponies don't have and the cows don't get makes makes this but this balance of herbivores within the ecosystem um that, which enables there to be the variety of habitats uh, and the mosaic of habitats that are so good for biodiversity. Um, one thing I will say uh, is that the, obviously I'm sure you're aware that at NET they, they don't have any apex predators, they don't have wolves or, or leagues of course, so they do a, a cull um, every year of, of a certain number, they do a take, they sell it for meat, the free range meat, and that's part of their business model. Um, and uh, you know, the fact that there are no apex predators, able to be in this country uh, in England at the moment or who knows when that will happen means that I think that's entirely appropriate otherwise the balance of that system would be would be lost um, the question I have and I don't know enough about it is in terms of the numbers and, and how, how many you should take and so on so that's that's one for them to, to look at and perhaps need to look at more in the future uh, but you also have the the fallow deer there um, quite skittish and nervous but but lovely animals very beautiful caught through the hedge there um, and the Dartmoor ponies which are really beautiful and they're just quite serene and they they just do their thing within this state and as I say they provide that balance they they um, they spread seeds they disperse they're useful for dispersal on, on the on the fur on the um, on their coats um, they in some cases they're very good at, at some disturbing the soil, creating new new spaces within the soil, just like the pigs are, um, as well as browsing higher up within the trees. Um, and then there's the pigs, which are fantastic. The Tamworths, uh, there's a couple of piglets here. And these guys, if they know there's something good in the soil and there's some good things to eat, they will be rootling around um, like nobody's business. And they, they, they know where to look. And it's just fantastic to see them at work. I mean, literally they could plow up a, a piece of land um, in no time at all if it's new and it's unexplored and there's some, some good food in there for them um, and that's natural playing is exposing the soil exposing um, uh, insects for the birds and, and other things to, to come and eat and it's exposing the soil for seeds to germinate either dispersed by them or just or, or just within the soil um, so they all play an active role and then what you get out of that is this amazing uh, landscape you get this this is a night shot but it's a what it's showing is topiary, almost a topiary mound of brambles here, which is a nursery space for the tree coming through. Sorry, I'll do on here. You can see the tree coming through here. I'm not sure whether that was a blackthorn or an oak. Uh, I can't be sure on that one, but um, I can't remember at the time it was dark. Um, but you can see that, and then there's the tracks of the, the animals through here as well. And this is a subtle landscape that you start to get with, which is coming out of the scrub. And, and the scrub is so important for the wildlife they found that the the nightingales and, and turtle doves um you know prefer the scrub to the woodland at net which is something that perhaps it wasn't realized before they did this work and then you get these this is a more sort of scenic picturesque view of the waterhole which kind of again is thinking back to that african plains type of situation if i if i caught a different time you can see all the footprints over here i would have had um probably 
uh, pigs, cows, potentially deer and horses there at the same time, which I will go back and I will get that photo at some point, I promise. Um, and if I carry on, again, it's a sort of slightly African plains type feeling. This was, this was an arable field 20 years ago, and it's now got um, the, the scrub mounds here. It's got the deer free roaming through it, uh, as well as the pigs, and it's got the trees coming through the, the nursery type bushes here of the of the brambles, um, which is amazing. And the biodiversity that you get with that is, is fantastic. Um, again, there's some photographically, it's, a, it's an amazing experience because you get these interesting shapes, the shapes here of these um, of these is these bushes and this, the trees are come from the browsing so it's a very different sort of landscape that you see it's very different sort of ecosystem you see compared to what we see normally we we so often either see woodland or green fields we don't see scrub we don't see shaped um we don't see uh, uh, bushes or shrubs or small trees shaped by the animals that are, are feeding on them um and yet that is that is natural. It is entirely generated by natural processes. There's nobody going along saying eat that tree there. Um, and you also, you know, very early in the morning, you might see thousands and thousands of cobwebs because the spiders love this ecosystem, and that's indicative of the invertebrate life that you find there. Um, and looking from above is also really interesting. So the, the drone footage I've taken. Um, again, you can see these very circular mounds um, here and here and here which is where the, the particularly the cattle are very good at, at browsing around the edges and then you've got in the middle of here the tree starting to come through that's protected from the browsing and grazing um, and it's coming through and you know, by the time it starts to overshadow the um, the bramble itself it will be uh, it will be immune from any damage from the from the herbivores so it's nature doing its thing um, and again, if you have an, a different shot from the from the drone, you can see these all the things I've been talking about so far. At the app. Um, and this wider shot here, which shows you this is the the neighbouring intensive pasture there, and then you've got all the different areas of net. This is one huge free roaming area, uh, all the way up to here. Some bits slightly more wooded, others scrubby. Oh, sorry, that's gone gone back. Um, really, really very special and very different to the the woodland or the green fields that you see in the surrounding area. So that was NEP, um, really very, very special place, but we go to something completely different now, Glen Feshi in Scotland. Now uh, that's all the way up here. I was lucky enough to spend a day there last October. Um, Glen Feshi, oh, hang on a second. Glen Feshi has been being rewilded, uh, if you say it like that, for 16, 17 years now. Um, and they don't, well, okay, I'll, I'll show you, I'll, I'll go through this in turn. That, that picture there is showing natural regeneration of Scots pine, primarily Scots pine, with a bit of beech and rowan as well. Sorry, birch and rowan. Um, Thomas Matt Dunnell, uh, I'm afraid another white man, but there does seem to be a very male dominated sector, um, something I'm looking at to, to try and find a bit more about. Uh, but Thomas is the local, guy in charge of this estate. It's owned by Wildland, which is owned by Anders uh, Poulsen, a, a Danish um, uh, clothing millionaire. And he is setting aside an awful lot of land in Scotland to rewild. As I said, this has been going for 16 years. Uh, you can see the deadwood in the background. You can see the, the, the natural growth to the left. And Thomas is a absolute wealth of knowledge about this stuff. And people are so important to effective rewilding projects because they, they know their places, they, they understand their land, and they know the people who they need to work with in order to, to make it work. Because, you know, we talk about rewilding, but that's not abandonment. It's not just letting it go completely. It's actually having a, a role, but a role which respects natural processes. If I carry on, they, as I, I was going to say, there's no real herbivores um, that they look after there. There are, there's three sheep, but they're not sheep they're sorry sheep three horses <laughs> but they're not ponies that they use for anything particular they're, uh, they've come to retire here the main uh, issue the main way they uh, have done the rewilding in Glen Feshi, um, is to do with deer management so this area as with much of Scotland was absolutely overrun with deer and so they've culled about 90 percent of the deer within this area uh, that was about 16 years ago, 17 years ago, and it's it's maintaining those levels uh, as very low, but appropriate for what perhaps if you'd had an apex predators there, uh, lynx and, and wolves, um, 
that has started to allow nature to regenerate. So you can see on the banks of this, yeah, these are a mixture of, of spine and, and wood is starting to come up the bank. Further away, where the, it's taken longer to get it going, they're completely bare. But you can see the tree line is gradually making its way up the hill here, which is brilliant. Um, again, here you've got natural regeneration. All this is Scots pine natural regeneration. Over here to the right, you can see the existing plantations, which uh, Thomas assures me are gradually going. Um, and then it hasn't worked its way up the bank here yet, but you can see that the trees are gradually, that the line of regeneration is gradually working its way over here and will continue to do that in coming years. Um, I think the next photo shows yeah, on the other side of the hill, you've got a mix old growth woodland here, which was allowed to stay and that has been spreading up the hill as well. Um, and then some natural regeneration uh, alongside the river there. And the river is obviously allowed to do follow its own path as well. So really, it is allowing nature to, to do its thing, it's allowing nature to take back control over the ecosystem, um, as opposed to it being very, very dominated by the, the, the browsing and grazing deer, uh, which was a problem for a long time. Uh, yeah, just, just, a, just another close up of the, of the natural regen there. But the other thing with Glenfresh is it's in the Cairngorms and peatlands are up there. Now, peatlands are hugely important for biodiversity. They're hugely important for carbon sequestration. Um, and I consider that the peatland restoration, if it's done in the appropriate way, is part of the, the rewilding family of approaches. So take this, you've got the geotextiles here and you've got some little dams uh, here. And once that's done, and once the deer numbers are down, you just need to let it on with it for forever, basically, because this system, peatland is remarkably resilient. Once the, the, the causes of erosion are stopping, then the peatland will start to recover. The sphagnum will start to take over. Uh, again, it is sphagnum out there, mainly rather than sedges. Um, and it will start to, to recover as an ecosystem and the associated biodiversity with that, whether that's for wading birds um, or whether that's the plant life or the insects or freshwater uh, uh, mussels. And, and so on. So lots of different, uh, there's, there's lots of different biodiversity within this habitat, but particularly it becomes more stable again, um, and it provides a solid ecosystem to sequester carbon um, and to provide a feeding ground for a variety of species. So the peatland restoration is a part of this, and that's something that they're very strong on in Glen Fashion. So if I move on to the fourth uh, case study, uh, I'm going to go to Mapperton, which is much closer to home for me. Uh, it's just up the road, in fact, and some of my, one of my favourite photos are, are from Mapperton. Uh, I haven't done a case study on this yet, uh, but I have provided some of the photos for the Mapperton Wildlands website, so you can see them there, but I will be doing more about this as I progress with the work. And that's, uh, that's the White Park. I'll talk about the White Park cattle in a minute. But first, again, people are really important. Now, I haven't shown the landowner here, it is um, Luke Montague, but what I've shown, I've shown Tom uh, and Sophie Gregory. Now, Tom and Sophie are dairy farmers, basically, and they, they have farm, they have um, two areas they farm. One is tenanted, the other one is up in Chard. And they were asked whether they wanted to take on a, a set of uh, a herd of white park cattle and look after them. Uh, they own them and they will be managing them in the newly formed rewilding area at Mapperton, which is 450 acres, I think it's going to be. A summer, uh, some land which has been fairly intensively used recently is now going to be left and other land which has been fairly unintensively used for the last 15 years. And that's, that's Coltley, which is where the, the White Park have gone. And these White Park cattle, which I just love, um, the black toes, black nose, black ears and, and black horns and the rest of the time they're white. Um, and this is uh, this is Esmeralda, who doesn't like me, if I'm completely honest. She has had a go at me once or twice, very gently, and I've been fine. But they are brilliant cattle. They are, they're <laughs> normally very gentle, um, and they're very, very loving in terms of the young, and they, they operate as a social group. And they have been left to, to free roam in this area. They are, um, um, sorry, I lost my track there. Uh, yeah, they're not supplementary fed, they're out all year. Um, they, they have to do the TB injections and obviously if there's any medical problems, they're called in, the vets called in, but otherwise they are just left 
to be the ecosystem engineers. And things are starting to change at Coley, uh, and which is fantastic to see. Um, it's also quite unnerving to be in front of a, a stampeding set of, of very, very horned cattle, um, including Alby there, who's the bull, who I'll show you in, in a moment. But it's also fascinating in, in the photography I was doing is to look at different things, different perspectives of the landscape. So taking an aerial photo, photograph of the um, of the white park with the drone you can then really see the horns you can see um uh you can see them in a way that you i guess in a way that you don't see them normally with domesticated um uh, cattle and i just think that showing things from this perspective particularly on a site which is not just plain grass it's not just beautiful green improved pasture it is looking rough you're looking a bit wild and when the 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 thistle, the creeping thistle and the dock and the ragwort comes up, um, it looks even more, even stronger and even more interesting in terms of how the cattle interact with it. Oh, and that's Albie, who, who is who was the star of my exhibition, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, who's an absolute legend. He's a bit of a softie as well, but I don't go too near those horns. Um, but what you've got here is, is Coltley Estate, which is um, this, this area here. It's a say it's been fairly unintensively used uh, for about 15 years, then it was stopped, and now it's only the white park which are on it. There's going to be ponies, there's going to be pigs in due course. But if you compare this landscape, this land, the, the hedges are exploding here. Um, there's a lot of little wet areas here which are, which are coming out to the improved pasture in the background. You can just see immediately that the difference in biodiversity and the difference in life there is going to be very strong. Um, there's also some really lovely old trees. This is a stag-headed oak, which is just one of my favourite trees. Um, and they have a real strong policy on, on you know, it's a rewilding area, you leave dead wood, just just, just leave it. This is one of my favourite photos from the, all my work, is, is this um, aerial drone shot of one of the dead trees in the area that's going to be part of this rewilding area. And that's, you know, at the moment it's providing home to, to insects, um, food for birds through that. And then when it falls over, it will gradually add its nutrients back into the soil. And, and I just get so frustrated when I see, uh, particularly recently after the storms, all of this dead wood, uh, well, it's a live wood in that sense, but um, the other dead wood, when it comes down, it's just chopped up, it's taken away. It needs to be left where that is you know, possible in terms of health and safety so it can feed back into the ecosystem. So um, I think we're doing all right. Not quite for time, perhaps a little bit uh, to rush on. But beavers. So I've done four case studies, but also I just want to talk a little bit about beavers. Now, people say, well, beavers aren't rewilding. Well, actually, they are part of, they're part of the process. They're part of rewilding. Ali Driver said that to me when I interviewed him. Um, they are. They were here. They, they lived perfectly happily in, in England um, for a very long time. They were made extinct by us. Let's bring them back, as you guys have done uh, in the, the Otter. And I applaud you for that. Well done, Devon Wildlife Trust, fantastic work. Um, but also in your uh, enclosure, where I was privileged enough to go in and talk to Mark up there. Um, this isn't, this is from Derek Gow, this photo is from Derek Gow's place actually. So, so it was his semi-wild one, which I was able to take some photos of. Um, but I see them as the, as the definitive ecosystem engineers in the way they, they, they manipulate the landscape so that they are safe, so that they have food, um, so they are, the, the byproducts of that is that we're getting cleaner water, we're getting flood prevention, uh, we're getting increasing biodiversity, and so on. It's just just superb. But also, oh, hang on, my computer's frozen. Sorry about this. That uh, okay? Um, where is it? They're also very cute, and there's nothing like a cute beaver photo to to get people smiling. Um, but just to go back one, uh, talking of cute, well, perhaps <laughs> less so, this is Derek Gow, Mark Elliott, and Richard Brazier, who some of you may know. Uh, Derek is, has been very responsible for a lot of the work with beavers in England. Um, Mark has been running the beaver enclosure in, for you guys, and Richard is um, a geomorphologist from Lexington University who has become a bit of a beaver expert in recent years. Um, both Derek and Richard I've done interviews with, oh actually and Mark, I just haven't again put them out on podcasts yet, but that will follow. And again, people are at the heart of all of this. Um, but with the beavers, you just, photographically, it's, it's an absolute joy. And it's just so interesting to see 
um, what they're doing. These huge trees that they're just taking down, um, they're skinning the bark off, as you can see on this one, the, the paths they're making in the landscape to, to just take themselves along. Um, the grasslands here, that I think one of the reasons that this site was set up is because they wanted to start to allow clearance to allow the grasslands to come back there, and that's happening. Um, and then with that, you have the flooding, and the flooding leads to peatland, and that's again carbon sequestration. And, and you get this mosaic of habitats, which is just amazing for life and for biodiversity. Um, that's the Devon site. They also, also have, Dorset Wild Trust also have a site, and this is one of the newer dams that they have um, here, which the, the uh, the beavers have made there um, but also they flooded a big area and so this a lot of this will die off it will, will sink sink down into a new peat layer um, in the bottom of the, of the pond of the lake um, and then you'll get different forms of life coming up as a result of that and you get clearer areas clearing the forest means that new things will grow up as a result um, and this is the overhead of the the, the the Dorset site the pond used to be this big it's now this big um, and you can see oh hang on you can now see you can see the dam at the bottom here which is at the moment which is just superb so that's the end of the case studies um if i just whiz through what's come out of this in terms of the products um i've got uh a website which i hope many of you will have been to and if not perhaps go to afterwards what if you leave it just on just what if you just leave it dot info uh, and i've got case studies on there as well as links to the podcast as well as other information um i've got podcasts which you can access through spotify and uh apple Podcasts and, and all the other ones um, i've also done an exhibition which is up currently at, the, at bournemouth university uh, but it's coming to bridport in july so if you're anywhere near bridport in july and most of august then pop along to the bridport Arts center where you'll be able to see the work um i'm also creating a book which has come out of all this this work uh, what if you just leave it and actually show a copy? Uh, this is only a prototype at the moment. I can't show that because of the background, but <laughs> but uh, it, you can see the idea of it here. And it's it's all about this concept of rewilding and wrap. It's explaining in as, as plain English through photos, through some very relatively limited amount of text, uh, what rewilding is, how, what that means in practice, how it's done in practice, and so on. And it, as again, as I said throughout, people are really key to that. Um, and the roles that people play in rewilding is critical. It's, it's not about just leaving it, it's about having a, a role. We are part of nature too. And we are we are doing this, but the, the fundamental difference is that we are not deciding what happens. We are allowing nature to decide what happens. And, and that's the, um, the, the book in its current prototype form. So, finding so really what have i learned from all of this i have learned a huge amount as i'm sure you can imagine from taking all those photos and talking to all those people uh, and i'm sure you may have some, some questions and contentions with what i've said but what have i found out on this well i've, I've never did this down to four things firstly um definition what is rewilding and what are people's understanding of it and it is complex people some people don't like the word they call it wilding they call it natural process led regeneration whatever else it is and that's that's all fine you know that it's all it's all the same fundamentally it's about allowing nature to take the lead and as long as that's happening you can call it what you like rewilding is a good buzzword though and it does seem to work um understanding you get a lot of people who know the concept they they see it they read it a little bit about it but actually the level of understanding is relatively low um, as I said, that I, this Jeremy Vine show I heard on Radio 2 a few weeks back was literally just focusing on polarised arguments between farmers and people who wanted rules to be reintroduced. And that's not what rewilding is at all. Yes, at some point, uh, and in, in parts, other parts of the world, particularly the US, in parts of Europe, um, the apex predators are being reintroduced and coming back, and or sometimes they never left, you know. That's great, but it, it's not necessarily something for here at the moment. Um, so what is rewilding? It is, for example, involvement of the beavers, reintroduced species, pine martins is another potential. Um, it's the, the wetlands that come out of that, the wetlands that, that for the reasons I've already said, uh, are fantastic and offer so many different ecosystem services and natural capital services. Rewilding is messy. You know, this is a tree that's been buffeted about, it's been browsed, 
grays probably a browse with, to within an inch of its life but it and it doesn't look it looks scruffy but it's brilliant it is part of the, the messiness of nature that we don't often see very often we don't like to see um it's the herbivores you know these are the mouflon sheep at coom's head in, in Devon, which is Derek gow's place uh, as long as you you know not overstocking then the the, the impact of these herbivores can be absolutely brilliant um, you can see that the bits of mud in the ground there they've been turned over by the the pigs the boar that are there as well um, but they have a role so rewilding is is also the restoration as i've already mentioned and it's allowing dead wood to to just stay there i'm going to hopefully go back to that in five years time this is over at uh, near kingston lacy and uh, if if tim and ellie have left it there to see what's happened to it and take another photo because you know you don't often get that opportunity because it's often taken away and rewilding is allowing uh, this is a former arable field just to have to be full of dock to be full of creeping, creeping thistles to be full of ragwort uh, and that's okay because of the, the the insects and the bird life and the bats that have come back since this has been allowed to happen over two to three years over at Kingston Lacey have been just amazing. And they are recording this now and they are developing their, their surveys of this so they can really evidence what's happened. Uh, again, to, to have a hedgerow explode like this, this is, was a neatly flared hedgerow beforehand and now it's exploding out. It's different life is coming out through it. You can see that in the different colors um, taken from above. Um, and also time, time's a really important thing in the wilding. So this is uh, Wild Woodbury in Dorset and hopefully that works. You know, at some point they would like it to become like this field at NEP uh, because that's, but they need 20 years for that. And that's okay. You've got to really push for allowing time for this to happen. Um, you've got to go 25 years 50 years plus it's it's a long-term commitment and it always should be um and also I, I just think it's for me it's been fascinating to see patterns in the landscape that the field on the left is a, a standard improved relatively improved pasture regular grazing the field on the right is uh, been turned over by some boar and i'm going to go back take a picture of that in the same place again from the air and see what's happening in that field because i guarantee you uh, it will look very very different to the one on the left now so that's something to look forward to but rewilding is also engaging with people and this is a doing a film for heel rewilding to promote rewilding uh, and engaging people in different ways and whether that's through a film or whether it's through vamping um and also finally rewilding is ragwort you know it's, it's that iconic species i'm sure there'll be questions about that afterwards um but it's it's important to put in there and just read Izzy's book to to see the, the ragwort argument um, and when I interviewed Ali Driver from Rewilding Britain, he, he talked about these concepts. There was a few quotes there. I think just the one I'll focus on is, is size matters. Scale is important. So the more we can do at scale is, is, is brilliant, but we can do a lot at our own level. So I've only got a few minutes left. I'm just going to whisk through the last few bits and pieces and then I'm done and open for questions. So the first, the first of my findings was the different aspects and the different nature of rewilding. Second, is it the future of nature conservation? No, absolutely not. Um, there are so many different ways of doing effective nature conservation. Sometimes you need to mow an area. Okay, so this is the undercliffs. This is regular, this is mowed twice a year by the Natural England staff because that allows the, the chalk grass to really flourish because they can't get herbivores on there. So they replicate that instead. And you know, you do need these these man-led processes in places you can't have rewilding or for targeting specific species but we have learned that if you're targeting species you might then miss other stuff so you know rewilding is allowing us to move on in different ways um you've got people like rob who who, who has the strimmer uh, for natural england and then nick over in dorset uh, wildlife trust who works with farmers on an everyday basis talks about these kind of concepts and helps people start to move towards a more natural based farming system and this is the national trust over in uh in dorset on arn where they created a scrape it's not a scrape for water it's a scrape for insects and they're just going to leave that now because actually they found from the footpath that the the beetles and other invertebrates really love the open soil if there's too much heather uh, then it, it can't do that so this is this is a combination of a rewilding approach and the traditional nature conservation approach the role of landowners is critical i found this throughout the whole project uh, whether that's the National Trust as over in Kingston Lacey, whether that's James Fuller, a farmer in, uh, in Marshall Vale, or whether that's Farrah's 700 years of, of farming 
uh, in the lizard. The landowner, if we are going to make a difference in the UK to our nature, the landowners have to take a really strong lead in this. And they are doing so at lots and lots of different places around the country, which is great to see. They all start with something like this or something like this. That's a wild wood brew. Uh, and they you know, see the year into rewilding at, at well, Ken Hill. And then hopefully they will end up with uh, something that looks a little bit like this, which is what they're aiming for. And the biodiversity that comes with it is fantastic. So finally, this is the last bit. Can we just leave it? Um, that's my question to, to people. No, we, we can't just leave it, okay? I, I was trying to find a photo to, to, to do, to show this, to exemplify this. Um, and I'm gonna just show this woodland from the Undercliff in, in East Devon. Um, woodland is what would happen if we abandoned land. It would just go to woodland at some point, if, we, if there were no natural herbivores to disturb it. And woodland is great, but it doesn't have the mosaic of habitats that we need for really encouraging biodiversity. It's also not, necessarily natural in terms of our past in this country, um, which evidence has shown there's a lot of wood pasture, a lot of different habitats, again, this mosaic. But, you know, we, we, have, we have roads, we have fences, we have agriculture, intensive agriculture, we have towns, we have railway lines. We don't have free roaming wild herbivores. We don't have apex predators. We can't just leave it, you know, but we can allow nature to take the lead in this work and in allowing uh, biodiversity to flourish back, which is something we badly, badly need to do. So whilst, no, we, we can't just leave it, we can, we are involved and we always should be, um, but we have to allow nature, nature to take the lead. So that's just about it. Um, I hope that this has unwrapped through rolling for you and laid it a bit there. You can decide that in your questions and uh, chat and any other comments afterwards. Um, I'll leave you with a quote because from Izzy Tree, um, it's a, it's people feel hopeful. It's so positive. This talk is not a call to arms. It's about to, perhaps, pre, perhaps pre, preaching to the converted, maybe. But it's to give you an idea of what I've found. Maybe inspire some of you. Um, maybe inspire you to do something at home or with your with, with neighbours or with with local uh, NGOs or, or estates. Um, and what would be your your take home messages? Well, about allow, as I said many times, about allowing nature to take the lead. Um, Understanding that rewilding is different for different people, but actually, you know, messiness is good, randomness is good, uncertainty is good, um, and the helping hand that we give, we we, we just start those processes off, uh, is also necessary. But generally, we can just let it get on with it once we've helped to start it. Um, I'd love you to sign up to to, to go to my website, sign up to the mailing list, listen to podcasts, follow me on Instagram, anything you like, get in touch. I'd love to talk more with anybody about this. Um, and I leave you with this fake advert I made as part of my course, which uh, I, I rewarded, a, so called, rewarded a bit of my garden, uh, dug it up, took a photo, and made this little statement here that if we all rewilded one square foot of land in the country, that would be the same as a thousand football pitches. So imagine what we could do if we all rewilded 10 or 20 or 200 square feet of land. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. That was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed that, as I'm sure everybody else did um, on, on that. And as you can expect, we've got quite a few questions. So because time is, is getting on, I'm going to go straight into the questions. And um, starting with one that I think is um, very relevant, uh, I've got a couple on, on this theme, which is from somebody here. They're, they're already working on rewilding their land, so well done. Um, they've already started with over 100, um, 100 native trees plant planted so far. What would you say are the three do's and don'ts to support the land? Three do's and don'ts to support the land. Um, set anything on it in a sense um, of trying to dictate what you want to happen. Tree planting is interesting. I, I'm very supportive of tree planting in certain places, but I also think that natural regeneration um, is, is sometimes better. If you have nothing to naturally regenerate from, then fair enough, you have to plant the tree. But if you have sources of, of seed planting, um, acorns and so on, then, then maybe, um, maybe you, know, you, you need to allow a bit more natural regeneration. But do's and don'ts, um, I think it's just, it, it's difficult to say. I'm, I'm not, not the expert at this. I haven't, I'm not doing it myself, but I'm talking to lots of other people who, who are. Um, having a bit of a blank on this one. I'm just sorry. I think it's just 
come down from the talk. I think not imposing yourself on the land and allowing it to be a bit self-willed. That's one thing I would say is, is critical. Um, that's a do and a don't. So that counts as one. Um, if you have a sufficient space, then you might consider introducing um, some herbivores for either a short or, or a longer period of time, depending on how much space you have. Because, or if not, you could replicate the processes that they do if you have a smaller space um, in different ways, you know? Or you could, you know, find someone who can lend you some cows for a few days. If you've got, um, if they've got no fence collars, then you could do some mob grazing in those areas. It just depends on, on what, what it is, what's the place like, um, whether it's marginal, whether it's on a hill, whether it's boggy. Uh, you know, if there's wet areas, allow them to stay wet. You know, if, if, it's, a, if it's a stream that needs, that's been canalized, then perhaps block it up um, and let's, let that start to flood again. Think about what nature wants to do and, and follow, follow nature's lead. That's, I think, what I'd say. Is that okay? That's excellent. Exactly. Yeah. Take, let nature take the lead. It's a different way of um, we're so used to managing the land and we're so used to um, putting our own stamp on it. But it's now it's a different mindset, isn't it, to actually think, what would this be like? You know, what would this be like? What, where does late nature want to go with this? What is it the, the going right back to what the basis of the land is? Um, so thank you. That was excellent. Um, another question saying bramble. Always a good one here. Should bramble <laughs> be managed, or should should is that something that you should just leave? I suppose it depends well, again if you've got um, anything grazing on it. <laughs> yeah, it does entirely. You know, if if you haven't got a way of allowing nature to 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 control the bramble, then you probably need to cut it back at something. But it depends on what you're you know what you're trying to do. If you if you are using the sort of what I'm calling the Franz Vera, the net process to to re for rewilding is you, you do need the herbivores there and they will browse the bramble. Um, but if you don't have that, you, you might want to replicate that because bramble will, will then, if it grows out, it'll smother other things. Whereas if you if you saw from, from the photos at NEP, from particularly from above, there's there's the bramble mounds are, are well spaced out. There's plenty of um, other growth uh, allowed in between them. There's trees coming out of them. Um, it's a tricky one, but I think it depends on what, what you're trying to do um, and whether you have access to herbivores, whether you're trying to follow that model. Yeah. I mean, it, it, these are kind of, I'd like, you know, I, I almost feel I need to see the place in order for to answer this more effectively, because yeah. what I've done is work from experience at different places, perhaps without the, some of the theory, and I, and I probably need to go back and look at the theory a little bit more. Mm. But do read the, uh, the, the Franz Vera approach um, to rewilding, which is what, um, Izzy and Charlie uh, drew on initially, although they they chose appropriately to do um, to act as the apex predator, which is one of the problems that they had with Ustavada plasm, which I can barely say, where they didn't do the culls and therefore they had the mass starvations, which really caused a problem to the, the whole movement of free wilding. Mm. Sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but I, I hope that's interesting. <laughs> no, it is interesting. No, exactly. It is interesting. Yeah, it's that, it's that role when you haven't got those apex predators, then something needs to be put in place uh, Absolutely. If you, in a rewilding and to, to keep the balance. It's all about the balances, isn't there? Yeah. Um, which on that, is in, um, I find this a very interesting question. Obviously, you've talked to lots of people that are, as you said, already converted or re already doing rewilding. But have you come across any landowners that are very against this or, uh, or, or a you know, very ne some negativity from landowners? Yeah, I have. And they've so far not um, not allowed me to interview them, but I, I'm working on that because I want to get that perspective. Um, partly, you know, the culture of farming um, goes back in some families hundreds of years. And I completely understand where they're coming from. It's about production. It's about uh, a productive landscape. Um, it's about making money to keep your family, it's made to, to be able to keep your land, to pass it on to the next generation. And I get that, but it, it is a very complex um, situation we have now. Single farm payments are going. Um, effectively, that the replacement for single farm payments will be payments for public good, um, for nature, which I, I'm very, very supportive of. And, and there needs to be a sea change in thinking that actually, you know, we, not all not all land has to be productive we waste a lot of food in this country um uh, we, we lose a lot of food from, from different reasons and actually 
the productive land should be productive, but the more marginal land, actually, let's set that aside for nature and let's let's make that work. Because if you do that and you have, um, you you know, for example, you have bigger margins, if you have um, marginal land on, on hillsides adjacent to a, a more intensive field, then the, the natural predators for the pests that you're going to get from that that rewilded or, or more marginal area is going to be a be a save you money in terms of pesticides which i'm hoping people wouldn't be using so much anyway and so on it's it's allowing the natural systems again to to work for the benefit of agriculture and this is why regenerative agriculture is so interesting and it's an area i'm, I'm looking at and hopefully we'll do some work on in due course because it's it's just you know in a sense alongside rewilding it's really taking um, it's really taking, you know, the agricultural world by storm, looking at no-till, um, you know, going back to basic principles of cover crops and, and, and not allowing the soil to be eroded and, and, and no pesticides and, and so on. And, you know, plowing in the, well, no, no, not plowing actually, but, but using clover and so on to help um, fix, out, fix the nitrogen and then support the, the productive crops that are in there. So um, Ken Hill has got some fantastic case studies for regenerative. Culture. If anyone's interested, look at the Wild Ken Hill websites. They are they are absolute stars for that. And um, yeah, I, I think I think it will the change will happen over the next five to ten years. And I think the culture will shift. But in some areas where it's productive farmland and it's not marginal, and you know, I, I think that will just carry on, and that's okay because we need food as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Just got time really for 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 um just, i'll just do two more questions actually if that's okay because we have got quite a, quite a few that is coming one um charlie barrel said uh anyone should be able to walk out their house and into rewilded nature if you're in a 90 square foot back garden or smaller than that realistically what can you do obviously we've seen this rewilding on a grand scale but realistically someone with with just a small garden or a small patch how can we all help what can we do okay well charlie what charlie i think meant was that out of your house you should be able to walk down to your nearest bit of farmland and there'd be nature and wildlife but yeah what can we all do um I, i've got a, a patch uh, my front garden okay uh, i decided to let it go last year um i just sized it back uh i have Gone out, gone out with a mattock. I've dug some holes in it um, to replicate the pigs. So that the, the scything replicated the uh, cows uh, and I've cut and collected. So I'm not allowing the nutrients to go back into the soil. Uh, I got some wild flower seeds from my, my friend Nick last year. I, I sowed them. I don't know if anything's going to come up. Um, but, you know, already last year when I started to do this, I was getting... Um, I try, I'm, a real, I'm really rubbish at remembering wildflower names, but I was getting a lot of, of, of really interesting species coming up, including poppies, which I'd never had before in the garden. Um, this year, I'm going to see what's going to coming up. I'm going to record it. I'm going to see what's happening. And I'm doing that in a, in a piece of land which is about three metres by five, um, so 15 square metres. And that will bring more you know butterflies more insects more bees okay it's not rewilding in the truest sense but it is trying to allow nature to do things on your doorstep it's not the scale that alice the driver wants and, and you know he's absolutely right in terms of doing this at scale as necessary but you can rewild a flower pot if you want and you know put it out see what happens and, and, and allow uh, allow nature to to decide what grows in there and it might look a right mess but you might be surprised at what you find in there Exactly, exactly. Everyone can do with living, living life a little bit more on the messy side. <laughs> <laughs> Having Absolutely. a little messy corner in, in your garden. If everybody did mm. that, that would make it. Yeah, I, I, we cut it. We, yeah. we, a tree fell down in the storm. We, we've cut it up because it was on the path and it was in the way. But I've left some of it now and I've left some of it. I put some of it, scattered it out amongst uh, along this, this patch I've got. I've left some in the, in the margins. You know, I, we get slow worms in our garden. Hopefully this is going to encourage more. Um, and I, I know that they're great habitats for grass snakes and, and all kinds of things. So, you know, perhaps, and somebody told me, I showed this on Instagram, somebody said, you haven't left any hedgehog holes in your fence. So I'm going to go out there tomorrow and dig some hedgehog holes under the fence so they can come in and out. So 
just little things, you know, well, this is stuff that we've all done for years and the Wildlife Trust has been promoting for years, but in a sense, rewilding is just a good hook to get people more involved. Mm, exactly, exactly. Thank you. So one last question, which I think you're going to like, is um, when is the book coming out? Ah, <laughs> uh, I'm hoping July, okay? Yeah. I'm hoping July. If you go to the website and go to contact and sign up to my mailing list, then I will let you know, or just on Instagram as well, at what if you just leave it, I will put, it, put out um, something on Instagram to say when the book's due out. I'm, I'd love to tie it in with the launch of my exhibition in Bridport, which is gonna be about the 19th of July. Um, if I can get it published by then, I may have to crowdfund it. Um, so <laughs> I don't know yet, but I, I, you know, there's a bit of work to do there, but hopefully this summer. Thank you for that question. That's really nice to hear that somebody's interested. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. I've, so. seen, I've seen a few nice comments come up from the chat as well to say thank you. So I'm, we've had some lovely comments. So thank you, everybody. Thank. I, you know, unfortunately, we're we're out of time. We do have some more questions. So I do apologise if your question wasn't was wasn't answered. We have got a load of it. Maybe if, if Sam's got a bit of time, we we will put it out in the email afterwards. With them, if there's a common theme to some of the questions, we can answer that in the email that have been being sent out. So that was a truly fascinating talk. So thank you so much, Sam. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, as I said, so we will be sending everybody a link to the recording and hopefully an e email which will have a link to Sam's website. Um, I also want to take, thank everybody here who attended. Thank you for giving up this lovely evening to, um, to spend a bit of time with them, enjoying those fabulous photographs and, and learning a lot, I think, about rewilding and that message about letting nature take the lead, which is so important. Um, for those of you that aren't members of Devon Wildlife Trust, you know, a shameless plea to please consider joining us. Um, it's, it really will make a difference to Devon's wildlife. And um, Sam has uh, alluded quite a lot to the importance of insects and the importance that, um, that they play as well in, uh, in, in looking after our land and stuff. And we have a very core cool program called Action for Insects as well, which uh, has they, some great They do resources. great work. Yeah. I can vouch for that. They do great yeah. work. And that program does have some great resources for if you're interested in doing more wildlife gardening and you're interested in leaving things a bit messy. You've got some great resources about how you do companion gardening and gardening and that without using pesticides. So that's all from us. Do keep an eye on our website. Um, we do have uh, more talks coming up. They will be posted on our website. And um, thank you for joining us and thank you for and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.